I'm going to start with uh, immediately to my left here. Uh, we've got John Palmer. John is the, the CLO of AT&T, uh, also in charge of staffing, which is an interesting role. You've right. got L&D and staffing. Um, John is the father of two five-and-a-half-year-old Yes. Ones. Yeah. So you're... Uh, Twin daughters. You're enjoying the break here, I'm sure. You know, it's like... <laughs> Sleep in, nobody's jumping in bed with you yeah, this morning. Exactly. Yeah, so, so welcome, John. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> so we have uh, next to John is Dan Pontefract. Dan has an interesting title. He's the chief envisioner at TELUS. What is a chief envisioner, by the way? We don't know. We're still trying to figure <laughs> it out. <laughs> because it's not a word. As an editor, you'd know it. So <laughs> he, uh, essentially, we're looking out for the uh, better half of our customers and their culture, their engagement, their learning, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, great. So it, I, I sort of set this up. We're going to try to tackle some controversial opinions. And one of my favorite CLO articles um, from a number of years back that Dan actually wrote for us, you made the comparison of, I might get this slightly off, but <laughs> you called the Kirkpatrick model a cockroach from the dinosaur age, if I'm <laughs> not mistaken. I think that was the terminology you used. I may have. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, uh, it didn't please the Kirkpatrick family. No, we heard about it. We did yeah, hear about it. I'm sure it, you did. You know. But we, 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 it's we, a sacred cow, Mike. That's why I'm here, I think. <laughs> That's right. So Dan's has no shortage of, 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 of opinions that he's going to be sharing with us today. Uh, next to, to, to Dan is Sharon Ruddock. Sharon is the CLO of SAP Sales. So welcome, Sharon. Interesting thing about um, uh, Sharon is you run a school in Ghana. Mm, Can you just side. tell us a little bit about that? Uh, it's called Jack Academy and started it four years ago. And I had adopted from Africa and got excited about doing something in Africa. And we started a little school, 120 students, and it's just in a very remote village, and it's so much fun and so enjoyable to visit every year and get involved with. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, that's excellent. That is great. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. <laughs> so awesome. And uh, at the end, last but certainly not least, Ashley Williams. Ashley is the deputy CLO and COO at McKinsey for McKinsey Learning. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, we have two parents with sets of twins. You've got a couple of twins as well. That's right, age 10. Yeah. So I'm a little bit ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you still want the break, though, I'm sure. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going to jump, dive right in. Um, Dan is, is going to be first up. Um, and Dan will make his argument much better than I will. But basically, the <laughs> argument being that as a learning and development function, we have structured ourselves completely wrong, and we continue to make the same mistakes with how we go about our business from a structural standpoint. So we sort of uh, titled this uh, The Audacity of Nope and how CLOs and learning departments really need to embrace the power of no. So Dan, kick us off. Thank you, Mike. I come from a chair of benevolence. Uh, so a big thanks to Mike, to Trey, to Kelly. I imagine them in Chicago sitting around a table thinking about a panel like this. And then, well, who could we get? And so basically, we are the island of misfit and outcast CLOs. That's the way <laughs> I would like to describe us. So the question that I like to serve up first is, is the CLO subservient? And is the CLO subservient to being an order taker? An order taker whom is basically thinking that they serve the business. And I'll come back to that in a second. So what is the business? Aren't you the business? Aren't we all the business? I hate that word, the business or the term. That's us. So for example, is your role to manage learning in charge of the LMS, stocking it with courseware only? Are you there to manage up providing the right data to the C-suite indicating, oh yeah, our employees are learning because look, our quantitative metrics are increasing like hours of training, courses taken, level one satisfaction scores are up this year. There's my homage. <laughs> Some believe the CLO is subservient to the CHRO or the chief talent officer or maybe in the corporate university in the pay as you go budget, subservient to those who hold the budget. But really, let's get back to what I think is the true question. What's the purpose of the CLO? You see, the sacred cow that I think that needs to be extinguished is the CLO has become too often the chief yes officer. Now, I remember six or seven years ago sitting in the CLO symposium at Dana Point with Jay Cross. Those of you who remember Jay Cross, he passed away sadly a couple years ago. And he asked me, he said, Dan, why don't you have the CLO title at TELUS? Because I just started about a year prior. And I said, Jay, 
If I took this CLO title, I'm doing what every other CLO has done. And he said, ooh, I like that, but don't tell Mike, he'll freak out. <laughs> There's way too many titles already. It's, it's true. <laughs> so to be a chief no officer is not to say no all the time, it's to become a chief business and learning officer. And a chief business and learning officer means that you are actually part of the business. You act with the best interests of the organization at heart. You're operating with a different type of purpose. You're not transactional, you're transformational. You're not interested in solely course completions, but you're interested in the profession of development. You're not worried about maintaining your 2% of payroll budget. You're interested in metrics like employee engagement, EBITDA, profitability, Customer satisfaction, COGS, NPS, CSAT. Chief business and learning officers are interested in these types of metrics because they are a talent chef. Talent chefs build out programs and options that don't appease the business. They do so in the best interest of the business. But they're ruthless with their decision making. They might often say no than they do yes, because they're more interested in the organization's strategy and its intent to thrive and survive. Talent chefs have their ear to the ground. They don't wait for the request to surface. They have an army of network citizens in the organization feeding them intelligence and information so that they make the right decisions at the right time for the right purpose of the organization itself. They are uncomfortable with the status quo because they're thinking about the best interests of the organization because they are the business. Talent chefs don't abide by the LMS. They are the chief business and learning officer. They're interested in saying no, not just to say no, but such that there is an organization there to say no later on too. They don't have a seat at the table, they are the table. Chief business and learning officers are there to look out for the long-term interests of the organization. They're not just a chief yes officer. They are part of the business, and the organization is better for it. My CEO, Darren Antwistle at Telus, says this. It's a wonderful line I'll end with. If you're not anxious about what you have purposely selected not to do, you are not sufficiently focused as a leader which is critical to ensuring your team delivers on your vital priorities. And that, I would hope that my panel agrees, is something that even Jay Cross would be in agreement with. So I want to get some questions from the audience, so you guys get, get your questions ready, but let's open it up to you guys in the panel first. It seems like the, hard, the, the premise of your argument is that the folks who are in the CLO role are not adequately prepared to be that more proactive person. Would you all agree, disagree with that statement or anything that Dan said? So I, I think that a lot of what Dan said is spot on. As a CLO, as a training organization, you have to have the right team that is embedded in all of the different business units that are out there. At AT&T, we've got a bunch of different business units. And what we find is that our best programs and our best curriculums are a full partnership with the business units. And we partner with the SMEs and the business units to truly find a need to go tackle a specific problem different in each different business unit. And it's not just an HR, you know, you know corporate university initiative. It's a true partnership and it's a true business initiative. And I think once you have that type of relationship embedded across all business units in your organizations, then you will have really great programs that come out. And it's not, for, for us, it's not about saying no, it's not about saying yes, it's about sitting at a table collectively and talking about what is the need that we can fulfill together to make this organization better. So we can focus on those metrics that I think you're spot on. I mean, it's not about hours and completions and getting the biggest you know, LMS that you possibly can. It's about what are you doing to drive profitability, efficiencies, how are you helping your workforce transform in this crazy technological transformation that we're going through? I would add one thing, uh, I agree, and I think you're also spot on. I would add one thing, which is, I think that we also need to reimagine what we're doing as not so much uh, learning and training, but as what I would call change management in any firm. 
I don't think there's one thing that we're working on right now in the learning and development uh, group that isn't tied to some substantial change that's happening uh, in the firm. So we also have to think about what that means with respect to our role. So this concept of saying no, I often find myself saying no in order to say yes. And what I mean by that is people come with an order, which is what I need is a training program. I think it needs to look like this. And these are the things I think it needs to do. And we end up saying, no, that may not be actually what you need. Let's back up and talk about what you need, what you're trying to accomplish. And then let's think about what we can do in learning and development, but also what else is gonna be required in the whole system. <clears throat> Right? And that system could be um, different sort of policies. It could be, um, it could be you know, role modeling and storytelling in the organization. There's lots of other things that have to come along, uh, in my mind, to actually affect change. And if what we're about is affecting change in organizations, then we have to understand our role, how it plays in the whole ecosystem, and not be so siloed in thinking about just learning. So I actually imagine myself as a chief change officer instead of a chief learning officer because I sometimes think that that learning piece gets us way too siloed into uh, you know, kind of training. Um, and I think that that's not gonna move the needle on change. Yeah, I agree with what you said. I think what's interesting is getting our organizations to view us that way, to view us as a partner in the business. So an example, the head of sales at SAP views us that way in learning as someone who can come and solve his business problems and we're at the table. And he says, okay, Joe down in you know, uh, India missed his number last quarter. Call Joe up and find out how you can help him. So we call Joe up and he says, well, what do you want? I did my required learning. Everyone on my team has checked all the boxes. What do you want? Because I don't have time for this. You know, it's like, well, your boss's boss says you missed your number last quarter. I'm here to help, but I did my required, please leave me alone. And it's like, okay, but we've done some analysis. We see that you didn't sell as much as the, of the innovative new products that were launched two quarters ago as your peers. Maybe that's something we can help you with. That seems to be one of the deficits that might be driving your poor performance. So I think some of it is really getting folks to view us that way, and it's not always easy. Uh, the other flip of that is getting your team to view themselves that way. So when, uh, you know, I say that we, we win awards, right? We win awards, we, our program improves sales performance by 20% for the people who took it, let's say, uh, for a specific program. And we go in and, and we're talking to someone, you know, the head of Norway, and we say, I say to them, you know, we can improve your team performance 10 to 15% in the next two quarters with this program. And we walk out and my uh, head of Europe says, what'd you just sign us up for? Uh, you know, how, how do you know that? I said, well, we won those five awards last quarter that prove we could do that. So I think some of it is a little bit of swagger that we can have that kind of impact, that what we do does have that impact. I'm believing it does so we can sell that benefit to the customer and, be, and get that seat at the table. So, but you guys all avoided my first question, which is about the CLO. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I agree. I mean I, I mean, I think a lot of folks in the room would agree, but are CLOs really ready for what you, just, you all just described? I mean, obviously you guys have all built up to that, but is there a, uh, let's make it personal, is there a, a deficiency in the way we're developing CLOs to be ready for this role that Dana is describing? And John, you're coming from the business, you know, about a year and a half. Yep, you just did it, time. the business. You're right, yes. So you're yeah. exacerbating I'm the a point. sacred cow, no, I know, yeah. You know, I, I think that the question has multiple parts to it in my mind. Is a CLO prepared to be the expert in every technological shift that's taking place, and can you be prepared to have the best curriculums in every nuance that every business has? I don't think there's any CLO that can do that. That's why you, you need to approach this as an enabler, and you need to approach this as a true partner so that you can rely on business unit SMEs to you know, be that partner and that conduit to understanding what is the need that's out there so then a CLO can go get their team together and go execute on that need. Mm -hmm. CLOs. I guess my bias because I, I didn't come from learning, I came from the business. Um, Losing. Yeah, that is amazing, isn't it? So, no, I, I, so I've always thought of myself as part of the business, and I've always, 
and, and that's my approach, that I'm, I'm helping move the business forward. Um, but I, you know, if you look at a team, I have a, a diverse group of folks who come out of different parts of sales or different parts of marketing and really have different perspectives. And I also have folks that are lifelong, incredible learning experts. And I think it's that mix that you need. And I think without that mix, it gets very hard to, to view yourself as someone who's moving the business forward um, because you, you don't have that experience or you don't come from that background or have enough people who can speak that language well enough. So I, I think it's hard to do if you've always done and your whole team has always done only learning. So just last thing is I think that ultimately CLOs need a higher vernacular and business acumen for certain, mm -hmm. to that point in your question, Mike. Um, and and that's, that's got to come from somewhere. And whether that means you come, quote, from the business as a CLO, or there's something that whether CLO or other organizations can do to infuse that sense of business acumen, I believe that's a step. All right, we got a lot more topics, so I want to also just pause, and it looks like you have a question or comment, or was that a Twitch? No, you do have a comment, okay. We've got a mic right behind you there. I do, thank you, sorry. Uh, this is Wendy White from International Paper. So my question is, do you have mentors? Does a CLO have a mentor? Is that hmm. something that would be helpful? And I was also curious if you think that CLOs should have like Six Sigma training and that, that problem solving training uh, that, that is given to several other ro manu manu well, management roles. Dan, you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, so I think, yes, absolutely, a CLO ought to have a mentor, but I would pluralize it. For me, I have four mentors, which sounds like a lot, but just bear with me. I have two ex-CEOs that, that are- What does that say about you that you have it's four true, mentors, <laughs> actually? I'm a thick learner, I suppose, <laughs> if not slow. Um, and the hair describes that a lot, doesn't it? Yeah. So two ex-CLOs, or CEOs, I should say, outside who have retired, and I use them for coffee chats, et cetera. I have an internal COO at TELUS, and I have a, uh, well, it changes, but a 14-year-old, a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old, someone in the Gen Z category, so I understand what the hell is going on with that age bracket as they come into an organization. What about that Six Sigma idea? I mean, is there sort of a, a, a corollary for CLOs that you all see? I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not as familiar with Six Sigma. What we have found that's interesting is to shadow people doing different roles within the organization. So you're able to understand the day-to-day -day and really get up to speed. I also agree with the business acumen and maybe more of a mini MBA than a Six Sigma approach. All right, we're gonna keep things moving. I promise that I know I saw a couple more hands out there. There will be other opportunities to, to ask some questions here, but I wanna, wanna keep things moving. So Ashley, you're up next. So um, we're, we're going to look at leadership development. That's obviously a big core piece of, of what CLOs do. And what we've roughly themed your talk around was you can teach old dogs new tricks. And the basic premise is that we tend to think of as leadership development, especially at the C-suite, as a very high-touch, in-person affair. And you think we're missing the boat on digital learning when it comes to leadership development. Right. So I was listening yesterday to the millennials panel and it struck me we were talking, you know, kind of once again about the differences between millennials and non-millennials and learning preferences and how do we meet those. And it took me back to uh, probably three years ago uh, at McKinsey where we were having this discussion about our partnership. And as con for context, our partnership, uh, we have about 1,600 partners in the firm. All of these people are essentially um, you know, C-suite executive level uh, folks. They counsel C-suite executive level folks every day and they themselves you know, have that experience, experience level. And we were facing a pretty uh, you know, sort of significant capability cap in a couple of areas. The partners themselves were saying, you know, we, need more, so we need some more support, we need some more help in some of these, in some of these areas. And, um, also, they were saying, and we don't have time for this, right? We, we do not have time for this. Um, and so, you know, how can you help us when we don't have time? We have extremely high expectations because, as we all know, doing leadership development, the expectations are in some ways higher than, for instance, uh, when you're onboarding people, you know, onto, into a firm um, at a younger, ex younger age and younger experience level. Um, so we have high expectations, we don't have any time, and we have a big need. Um, you know, how are we going to do this? 
And we had this uh, quite a significant debate uh, about, well, that means we're going to need to try some of the same things that we're doing with our non-executives, if you will. We're going to have to try that with, with our partnership. And a lot of people said, that's not going to work. It's, it's absolutely not going to work. I mean, these, these guys need and gals need high touch uh, approaches to, to learning. We need to bring them all together. They need to learn from one another because peer-based learning is a big deal for executives. Um, and how can you do that if you're going to do, you know, kind of all, all digital? And we said, well, we're going to give it, we're going to give it a go. And so we did. Um, we created something called Partner University. Um, it uh, is, was a year-long blended program, so it did have some high touch. It had in-person as part of it, um, but it also had significant digital portions. It had significant peer-based um, cohorts that worked outside of the actual in-person uh, you know, programs. And I think the mo it had gamification, so you know, I would have never thought, honestly, that was one of the areas where we were really questioning whether or not you know, gamification would be something that uh, higher, higher level executives would engage in. Um, it had gamification, it had, uh, as I said, the social peer groups and, and learning. And importantly, it also had complete actionable, um, so it had action items that were tied to the client work and the impact that they were having the clients right then and there. Um, it was extremely well received. Uh, 85 plus percent of the partnership engaged, uh, 90 something percent of them doing the digital modules, um, 80 plus percent saying they had taken the, what they had learned uh, to the clients for what they considered you know, great impact, and now we're on to the next round. So, it's not, so what I guess I would say is we were surprised, pleasantly surprised, we were happy uh, about that, but it's not so much about you know, whether or not you can teach the dogs, you, the old dogs new tricks, really. What it is is about really focusing on how it is that we're doing, if you will, instructional design. And how do we know, what do we know about that? What do we know about adult learners? And applying those equally to different you know, subsets. And not assuming that because one is from one generation or one is at a different level in the organization that necessarily these same um, solid instructional design principles and all the new things we're learning about what it takes uh, to engage and learn, don't assume that they don't apply uh, to literally all audiences with some slight tailoring and, and tweaking. And so I think we can really change the game in executive, if you will, education, higher executive, if you will, education and, and leadership development, and not assume that it has to look exactly like it's looked literally for the last probably 30, 40, 40 years in terms of high touch, high tech. So let me, I'm trying to phrase this right. So. <laughs> McKinsey employees, especially at the level that you're talking about, um, probably have no shortage of self-confidence and feeling that I should have somebody working directly with me. I don't want something across the board. They're special snowflakes. Right. But each of them is a special snowflake. <laughs> no special snowflake. And I hope I'm not you know, expressing that uh, uh, in a bad way. But I'm sure you all have special snowflakes <laughs> in each of your I'm organizations. I'm Canadians. Like we have, we have a, a number of special exactly. snowflakes here in the, in, on the stage with us. But, you know, so... <laughs> How do you, how do you then make, how do you make the case in a strong way that hey, this we're not taking something away from you, but we're actually making it better for you, and this is truly a bespoke program because you got to you got to really probably talk the right talk to them. I mean, what sort of talk do you, how do you talk to um, those sorts of folks differently than you might other audiences in your organization about their development? Mm. Mm. You know, I, I always, I'll give it through an example. How's that? So four years ago, just about this time, um, I pitched an idea at TELUS to our CEO in the C-suite called the TELUS MBA. And it was because I figured out that we were spending about a million dollars on MBA tuition, uh, you know, payments at like 10 or 15 different universities a year, whether partial payment, full payment, whatever. And I was like, that's a lot of money. Why don't we build our own? And they thought I was crazy. Like, we can't build our own MBA. Like, the MBAs are done at the schools of business, and that's what they do. And I said, well, actually, here's how we could do it differently. And here's how it would benefit TELUS. 
And so I lined up all the points, right? So here's the business stratagem, here's what we could do with the projects, here's how we could get ROI from the you know, X million dollars we'll invest in this to what we'll get out of it long term. So that de development of people, but also the projects that would go towards you know, fixing and filling in the holes that tell us. It took a year and a half, a year and a half, Mike, of me reinforcing this to members of the C-suite to say, this is a good idea. It's a business idea that we've been actually kind of losing money over here, but let's make money over here. I finally got a call, and the call is, you know that stupid idea of yours about the Tell MBA? Can we go do that now? And so we launched a 10 university RFI across Canada asking if those universities would change the way in which that they do ID and development and do it blended so that we could have some on site but lots more virtual, using virtual worlds if you can believe it. And we launched in the fall of 2015 a two year MBA with the University of Victoria who were one of only two universities in Canada that said they would do it that way differently. Mm -hmm. So not only do we have to convince the C-suite at TELUS, we had to convince 10 different schools of business to do things differently than what they've been doing. But it went back to now convincing you, Vic, and saying, you know, you can do it differently and you can take this model and begin changing the way in which you educate. So bottom line is gumption, resilience, Duckworth's grit, if you will, and business strategy. And I think you also have to have a, a big vision and you don't, you shouldn't be afraid of just trying something. And you know, we've seen the ability to move very fast in new modes of learning by just doing trials. You don't have to launch something to all the employees across whatever company you work for. Pick a pocket that is very interested in driving to the future faster and enable them and partner with them in this new modality or this new form of delivery. And once you prove that success, then you can launch it out to the rest of the corporation. Mm -hmm. Sharon, you, any advice? Oh, go ahead, sorry. go ahead, Ashley. No, go to ahead. your question about the special snowflakes and the you know kind of growth curves, we've also uh, I know uh, Bob is going to be here uh, later today speaking. Uh, we've done a lot of work on this concept of um, well, Carol Dweck's kind of growth mindset, but also Bob's work on different transformation curves and really um, helping people to understand that you actually never stop learning um, and you never stop growing um, and that even while you are a special snowflake because indeed these are quite accomplished people um, there is still a lot still to be you know to be learning growth and that's a that's a great thing um, versus a seen as a remedial thing or any of those type of things um, and I think it's been really interesting to watch uh, the part, I'll call it the partnership, uh, you know, at McKinsey, but a lot of senior folks in really embracing that and in some ways almost being, I don't know what the right word is, relieved is maybe the right word, right? That, oh my gosh, no one expects me to stop growing. They don't expect that I have everything, you know, that I need. In fact, they're actually expecting a different thing. They're expecting that I will continue to, you know, to learn and grow. Um, but that's a tough mindset shift. And it's something that you have to be thinking about when I was talking about change earlier and change management. You always got to be thinking about those underlying mindsets so you can marry the instructional design, if you will, with what is the underlying mindset that I've got to deal with if I'm going to actually affect the change you know, that, I'm going, that I'm going towards. So Sharon, I want to get your comment and then I want to go out to the audience. So if you've got questions or comments, get ready, please. Sure, so um, I think our special snowflakes, I often we have a leadership program and there's initial resistance to your point that uh, you know, I, you know, my situation's unique, my country's unique, my challenges are unique, I'm unique, and I don't need to go to that training or take that training. But they're also the same people that when they actually are then coerced into going, um, have this tr transformative experience of, wow, the problems in Russia and the problems I experience in South Africa are so similar because we're selling the same products, we work for the same company, and we can share ideas on how we solve problems and what the best practices are. So I think in the end, and to your point, I think they, they're as interested and capable of, of learning um, at our age. Um, and so I do think, but yeah, there is resistance. I think it's a little bit of packaging and marketing, but, and then they have to hear it from their peers that it was a valuable experience. Mm -hmm. All right. Comments, questions in the audience? Got one right in the middle there. Thanks. 
Hi, this is Sean Kelly. I'm with uh, NIIT, and I wanted to kind of revert back to. I'll stand up because I'm people are looking around trying. Just to having a little bit of trouble hearing. Yeah. Hi, is that better? That's better. That's better. I'm he I'm having a lot of feedback here, so it's a little bit distracting too. Reverting back to what was discussed about earlier about seeing yourself as a CLO and things too. What we found, we worked with a lot of organizations globally. In fact, one of my colleagues, Ed Trolley, wrote a book called Running Training Like a Business. And a lot of it is seeing yourself as the CEO of your business with your internal clients as stakeholders, shareholders in your business. Because you have to report back, how much did we spend? And then what did we put back in the business? So it's almost like a CEO every quarter has to share, well, sales went up by this, revenue's up by this, operating expenses are here. And it's almost the point of saying you have to track that from what I found from successful CLOs is what have we spent, but what are areas we put back into the business too that has seen actual improvement in the business as well. So it's sort of like what I've seen is that position yourself as a CEO of your business and your internal stakeholders are your shareholders. They'll see, oh, I see we put in this, but we're getting back on that too. So just want to get your thoughts on that as well, if that makes sense. Yeah, so it's sort of a both and, right? You've got to report on the costs and the efficiencies of your business, but you also have to make those connections to the strategic goals of wh where you're going. How do you all make that, that balance? Sounds like a question for Dan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think you have to make that balance. I mean, Dan said it in, in his comments about making sure that you're aligned to the right metrics. I mean, none of my business unit leaders care about how much training we do. They care about what did that training do for the business? How did that transform those employees to be better, better at servicing and selling to our customers and taking care of our customers? And you know, one of the things that I think every CLO has to be very in touch with is what are the key KPIs for each of the different business units out there, and then make sure that their teams are accountable, compensated, and aligned to those exact KPIs as they're supporting those business units. Anybody want to add anything? I, to I couldn't have said it better because there's organizational KPIs, engagement, you know, overall innovation, number of patents that say might come out of the engineering group, like that might be a KPI specific to a group. So that's, as a CLO or a chief business and learning officer, as I keep saying, right, that's, that's ultimately what I think you got to start thinking about. Yeah. All right, we're, we're getting good questions coming in through the app, as well as I know there's some folks in the room, but I want to keep things moving. So we're going to turn to Sharon, Sharon now. And uh, we're going to talk about 70 2010, a, a favorite thing that we love <laughs> to talk about in learning. And your argument that it's time to end the 70 2010 model. We have, we have a round of applause. <laughs> Already I, supported. I think it's interesting because uh, 70 2010, when I first started my learning job four years ago, I looked it up. They're like, oh, yeah, 70 2010. 70. So I looked it up. Well, what is this thing? And, uh, and you do a little research and you find out it was created in. I've heard 1956, 1980, but any way you look at it, it was created a very, very long time ago before the, uh, you know, the internet, before cell phones, before iPads, before all the things we do in a digital era. So it seems like it's had its day in that regard. It also initially started out as a survey of 200 executives. Um, so it really didn't show a diverse group of people or different stages of a career. And it was self-reported numbers of what they thought or how they thought they learned, which is always inherently a little bit flawed. Um, and I, I also would imagine that the 1950s, 1980s executives uh, were not that diverse a group of people in and of themselves. So right there, I think it's, it's rather flawed, but yet it's interesting that it has taken on a life of its own. I mean, it's so pervasive. Other studies have come along since then in the 90s and 2000 they come up with different numbers that are anywhere from formal learning being 5% to almost 50% of learning. And every study comes up a little different, but no matter how many times it's, I think, debunked, you still see major corporations that are focusing their learning investment and approach on 70-20-10 and are quite vocal about it. So, uh, you know, I think about our experience at SAP and my experience as a learner and I think, you know, first of all, formal learning used to be very much ILT, face-to-face -face driven. Now you can learn anytime, anywhere. I mean, on my way down here, I did a, a mini MOOC on my phone on innovation and SAP's latest innovation. And on the way back, I'm going to be working on a simulation of how to give feedback. And it's gamified. I'll be competing against my peers on whether I give feedback better or worse. 
And that is formal learning. It just can be done anywhere, anytime. So it's just hard for me to believe that 10% is all we get and the only impact we have as a formal learning um, approach. And then second is social, and social includes mentoring and social, and we all know social media and the amount we learn socially has just exploded. I mean, in the 1980s, I guess social learning would have been going out to lunch, I'm not even sure. Um, but nowadays, obviously, it's very different, and it's very robust, and it's so easy, and we all learn that way all day long. And then I think also about mentoring, and I know, you know yesterday we heard that millennials, and I find this to be true as well, really want to be coached and mentored, and we're all doing a lot more coaching and mentoring as a result, and we're building that into everything we do. So the notion that social is just 20% seems really insufficient to me as well. Um, and the other challenge, I think, is if you, any rule of thumb you pick, if you say, okay, for every program and every approach and every problem, this is how we should think about it, I think it misses the mark. Um, we were asked to do a program a couple of years ago to transform, you know, back to this notion that you got the boomers aging, you need to bring the millennials along faster. We were asked to create a program to jumpstart millennials into the company in sales. And we created a very intensive Silicon Valley experience where they come for three months and learn formally. And then they go back into the field and shadow for three months very intensively as well. And so the notion that even a 25% formal learning, we went pretty far the other way and pretty far the other way in social. And it actually worked. It accelerated their careers five years as far as their sales capability. So I think it's the problem you have to look at to know what's the best approach. But either way, I think that rule of thumb is, is dead. And I'd love to hear from you all, from your experiences, what do you think it is? If it's not 70, 20, 10, in your experience, what is it closer to? And maybe my panelists as well. Uh, because I think 70, 20, 10 is quite off. <laughs> All right, with that invite, we're looking at you. What do you think? Formal learning, 10%. Tim, we've got uh, right up front there. I think the Josh Burson model of experience, exposure, education, and um, oh, what's the fourth E? There's four E's, and it really is intended as a replacement of the 70, 20, 10, because it talks about how the entire ecosystem is integrated mm -hmm. to ensure that employee performance is possible, right? And that the entire structure of the organization is set up to provide learning agility and promote that, um, that kind of sense that learning is all the time, right? As a part of uh, somebody's job. So if you haven't heard of that model, I'd encourage you to go look at it. Thank you. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about the 70-20-10 is that it leads to 100%, and that I assumed is on a 40-hour work week. And I think that really what we need to be thinking about is what beyond the 40-hour work week should all people be engaging in from a learning perspective in this culture of continuous learning. I mean, this is not, in my opinion, just a, a, a slice and dice the 40-hour work week and figure out where training fits in. Training fits in you know, based on the need for everyone well beyond that 40 hour work week and people should be engaging in different learning opportunities with their business all the time. And uh, in, this sounds like a name drop thing, but in my first book, Flat Army, I published results of a two year study we did at TELUS. And I was just gonna quote the numbers here. So the two year study we looked at was how are people actually learning without telling them what to learn per se. It was like, what's actually happening naturally? And we found and discovered that 120 hours on average was the number of hours people were learning per year. But it actually broke down into essentially a third of the time each on what we call formal, informal, and social. And so the formal was the classroom, the e-learning, the LMS kind of stuff, if you will. And so the other 80 hours was this combination of the informal and the social. So then we started you know, helping the organization define or redefine what informal and social meant. And clearly on the social side, we're talking about social collaboration, social learning, using things like JAM from success factors and so forth. But also on the informal side, coaching, mentoring, shadowing, rotations like book clubs, things, stuff like that. And it was amazing. And so we just called it pervasive learning. Pervasive learning being, so in the sort of time that you have at TELUS, 120 hours is sort of the TELUS time, but we got people um, you know, understanding that learning happens in an ecosystem which includes your life. Mm -hmm. So then we started seeing people submit the time that they're doing, quote, after work. Mm. And it turned out that there was like 240 hours more, right, of formal, informal, and social learning happening outside, quote, work hours. Right. 
And that's why we said, well, learning is pervasive. It happens all the time. It's formal and formal social, so just get on with it. Well, I also think with the increase of, of kind of blended solutions, it's going to be almost impossible to, if you're trying to hold yourself to some standard of 70, 20, 10 and measure that, it's going to start to get virtually impossible to really understand that. So do I call, we have a formal program, um, a formal program that is blended, that has you know, no in-person, it has social coaching, you know, matchups, it has, you know, digital elements, and then it has work that you're doing with the client. Okay, well, I've just hit on the, the 70, I've hit on the 20, and I've hit on the 10. And so how do you classify that? And, and in some ways, why do we need to classify it, I guess I would say. So maybe it's dead just because we don't need to classify anymore. Maybe what we're saying is more of the pervasive learning or the learning every day, everywhere, or whatever phrase you want to use to say, this is all part of you know, what you do and learning every day and get away from these classifications that are gonna, frankly, become increasingly difficult to measure anyway. These, uh, these two University of Michigan professors, I have, I have this as well, did a, did a study on 702010, and this is what they said. There is actually no empirical evidence supporting this assumption, yet scholars and practitioners frequently quote it as if it is fact. <laughs> great. Like, I don't know why we still use it. I honestly don't. I don't either. All right, that's settled then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from the audience? Or anyone disagree in the audience that yeah. thinks we're all just uh, doing groupthink? Oh, okay. No 70 20 10. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you. It seems a little bit of a cop out. Yeah. So. Seventy twenty ten is not an excuse. Right, I agree. Sounds like a very good title for the next article. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. All right. Let's turn to our last topic. And there's some great questions. I think I'm going to pick a couple of these questions that folks are submitting through the app for maybe a close for all of us. But I want to get to our next and, and final segment for the panel, and that's to talk about. <laughs> Another sacred cow of learning, which is classroom <laughs> training. I, classroom in classroom ILT. Right. The, the, the origin of, of, the, of the learning function and, and how we've long done it. Um, John, your argument as you've come into AT&T, which is an absolutely massive organization, is that we have hit the absolute potential of that model and it's now time to dismiss class. So tell us about that. So I think that if you are in any business, any industry, speed and velocity in keeping up with the changes in the marketplace are absolutely vital to the success and the future of your business. And as we have evaluated all of the technological transformations that are taking place inside our four walls and all of the constant product changes and customer demands that are constantly changing, we simply don't have enough time to fly everyone to a central location in a classroom have them in there for pick your amount of time, days, weeks, months, whatever it is. And we have to be open to doing things differently in order to keep up with the demands of the marketplace. And this notion of being able to train virtually has been something that has been really, really successful for us inside AT&T. It's allowed us to train thousands of people in days when traditionally if we would have gone to the classroom model, it would have taken us four or six months or longer than that. Uh, we've tackled this from a leadership training perspective, a product training perspective, a new hire training perspective. And in all of these lines of businesses, we have done traditional classroom training for years and years and years. And the ability to drive a culture of continuous learning does not take place in a classroom. And if you've got the right platforms in this virtual environment, in a MOOC environment, then there are so many things. I mean, we haven't even tapped into all of the potential that exists in virtual training, in my opinion. There are so many things that can be more efficient and more effective virtually than in the classroom. Just a couple examples. You can create you know, online study group teams. And you know, those teams can be dispersed around the country, around the globe, and you can have those unique experiences that we've all talked about 
in a real-time way. And it's not about, you know, I have to pick up the phone. It's about I've already got an embedded social platform and an embedded social network so that we can constantly speed up the way that people learn, speed up the way that people problem solve. And these platforms, what we're seeing is really enabling lots of productivity that is giving direct benefit back to the business. And it's, it's just a way for us to be able to keep up with all of the changes in technology in a much more efficient and effective way. Does that mean that we will never do classroom training? Does that mean that we will never have face-to-face -face conferences? Absolutely not. There is always going to be, in my opinion, a purpose and a value for that type of networking. But we have to challenge the traditional modality of just bringing everyone in into one central location and, and putting on a training seminar or a training classroom because it's, it's just not efficient for what's going on in the marketplace and it's not going to keep up with the customer demands that are out there. So what is that value in classroom training then if it's not all those other things that you just laid out? So I see a lot of value from a, a you know, big conference perspective where uh, you know, you are networking, you can build relationships in a face-to-face -face environment differently than you would in a virtual environment. So I think that relationships can, can be made on a deeper level face-to-face, -face. but when it comes to just sheer, you know, let's be more efficient and effective on this business problem, then, you know, virtual absolutely has tons of opportunities for us to be as efficient or even more efficient. What we've seen in, in some of the business units where we've you know, started to transform from traditional classroom environments to virtual environments, especially as we're hiring a younger workforce, they would prefer a virtual environment as opposed to traveling, being away from their friends and their family for a week at a time and going into that traditional classroom mode. Mm -hmm. Resonates with you guys? I think it does to a large extent. I think um, we need to do more virtual and we do do a lot virtually. Um, it has exploded over the last few years, but we still do classroom training. So I would say our amount of learning has gone up tremendously and what's driving it is the digital and the virtual, but we probably still do about the same amount of face-to-face. -face. And we try to save it for transformative experiences, things with networking, but accelerating early talent, a lot of our leadership programs are still face-to-face. Everything we do face-to-face -face is blended, so there's an element of virtual before and after and on-the-job experience to be part of the program, but we still do face-to-face. -face. And uh, But I'm always pushing the team, okay, why can't, you know, why can't we do that one and that program and that program, can't we? So we've started changing some of our programs and creating and morphing, morphing them, uh, but we still do a fair bit, and I don't, I just, I still believe inherently there's some things that you can do much more efficiently and faster. And the other concern we sometimes see is the adoption of digital learning isn't as good as it could be. And I think that's a big challenge as well. Just getting the entire organization to adopt that as an approach to learning, I think has slowed us down in how much we can do virtually. I think one of the big things is, as we're thinking about virtual, Virtual training, in, in my mind, is not just taking your traditional classroom curriculum and then replicating it either online or over a you know, conference call or telepresence. You have to really think through what is the more efficient way for us to deliver this training. So Sharon you know, shared that you know, she's listening to podcasts as she's driving. I mean, there is a very unique opportunity for us to think about short form video, meeting the learner as they consume news and sports and entertainment information in this learning environment. And it's not just your traditional you know, instructor going through eight hours of curriculum every single day. You can make it to where people can engage in and out of this learning whenever they want to, wherever they are. Mm -hmm. I'll give an example to that. Um, we, which is sort of pervasive learning or blended learning encapsulated. So we have uh, an event that we've done for years called SLF, Senior Leadership Forum. And it's a two-day event for the 180 VPs and above. And, and it's been there probably for 10 years, 12 years now, so 2005. And it's a wonderful event. I mean, it's high touch. It's this. It's the CLO Symposium. Um, but what we decided to do about five or six years ago was to have the 12 days of learning prior to the event. And the 12 days of learning were basically once a day sending them out to go either read this article, catch this TED talk, uh, catch an internal TED talk that we do, these TELUS talks, 
and then go to the discussion forum to discuss it that day. And so you'd have this kind of exchange going on. So it's this kind of pre-event learning going on, getting people into the theme of the conference and what we're doing. And then we had the 12 days of post-learning to reinforce the, some of the things that we did within kind of the you know, 16 to 18 hours of curricula that was during the two-day event. So that basically turned into 26 days of learning, if you kind of think about it, in totality, right? But it was done in this formal, informal, social way that allowed executives to see, oh, now I understand what you guys mean. And that's when things started to kick uh, into TELUS. So I'm curious, so I mean, what does this mean from an organizational department, the, the learning department level? So, you know, I know at and is going through a massive skills reskilling of the mm -hmm. organization. So you sort of have those marching orders from top down that we need to change. But what needs to change in how we structure ourselves as a department to do some of these things that we're laying out and moving away from a classroom uh, model that we are comfortable with and know from a legacy standpoint, and in fact have many staff people who do that, whether it's instructional design for that or people who travel around and go into rooms with people in, in, uh, around the country, around the world. It's a huge shift for our designers and our instructors. They have to learn how to design in a mobile and a digital environment. Our instructors have to learn now how to you know, be able to deliver course content in a virtual platform, in a MOOC platform, and you know, figure out new and exciting ways to be able to engage with their students, engage the class, so that again, the KPIs that are completely aligned with the business unit that they're ultimately accountable and compensated on are being driven in the most efficient and effective way. So it's a huge transformational shift for our corporate university, from our design to our instructors to everybody thinking about how to be able to deliver training differently. So how do you make that case then? I mean, so you've got a, you've got a large group of people sure. in the corporate university who are doing this. What do you do with, with, on a... On a on a, on a sort of an individual level as the leader of that function to say, guys, we need to change. We really need to, to take this to a different level. So we talk about all of the different technologies and all of the different emerging modes of delivery that we want to be in. So you can go things as simple as short form video content. I've got more designers now that have the ability to create videos than I did a year and a half ago. I mean, the skills transformation and, and the training that we've put our design team through just to be able to deliver and create that type of content has been just a Herculean effort and the team's done a fantastic job. Our instructors have had to go through training on how to be able to deliver in our virtual learning classrooms, how to be able to deliver course content in a MOOC platform. We're now looking at things like virtual reality and how do you create training in virtual a virtual reality environment. What is the best training that you know, would even be effective in virtual reality? Because again, it's not just about taking what you've traditionally done and now having it filmed with a 360 camera. It's about where is the real value and the real benefit that can be driven in this new in this new world, and it's not everything, but there are you know, very specific niches that are out there where you can create and deliver a very unique, customized experience for learners that they're not even thinking about. I mean, let, let's be honest, business units aren't thinking about what is the most effective new way of training. They just want to get trained. They have problem, solution, let's, let's go make that happen. It's up to us to be the thought leaders and to be the ones that can push the envelope on these new, more efficient, effective ways of delivering training. How are the uh, rest of you tackling the legacies? Go ahead, Ash. I was gonna just build on that point because I think it's sort of this, there's a little bit of the chicken and the egg you know, problem here too. So there's definitely the learning organization that needs to be upskilled um, and also frankly needs to believe that, they're, that this shift is the right direction um, and that uh, this is an exciting opportunity for them versus something that is taking their job away or taking what they love about their job away. So we've had a lot of those conversations on the one side mm -hmm. about why is more digital exciting and how can you play a role in that? Because there was a lot of fear about, I'm used to teaching courses or I'm used to developing these in-person things. That's what I love to do. Are you telling me we're no longer going to, to do that? So there's a lot of mindset shifts and capabilities on that side. On the other side, there is the, sorry to use this point, the business units that also do not yet believe the efficacy, I'm just putting it out there, do not believe the efficacy of digital. And so they will often come to you with this, again, the order taking with the, I want a 
you know, I want a program. And when you suggest to them that it shouldn't be a two-day off-site with faculty, they look at you like you have three heads. Like, well, why wouldn't it be? You can't tell me that I'm gonna do this virtually. I'm not gonna get what, that's not gonna get a good return. So it's, it's like mm -hmm. the chicken and egg. You gotta have both of those things happening at the same time in order to propel the actual change um, and the belief that this is actually the right direction for certain types of skill building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, honestly, I think that the profession needs to shift from the training mindset to the Sherpa mindset. We need to move from the proverbial sage to the, you know, guide on the side, stage on stage from guide on, to, to guide on the side, sorry. Mm -hmm. Any, looks like we've got a, a question over right there, Tim. We've got about four minutes left. So we've got time for a question and then we'll wrap up. Thank you, I'm Arti Sharma from Raytheon. I would like to ask the question from a learner's perspective. So uh, let's assume I'm a learner and I have expectations from my management to be a super performer, right, at my work. At the same time, I have expectations to, to be a super learner so that I can integrate the learning as well as the performance together and demonstrate it to, uh, to the organization. So if we integrate the concept of performance, learning, as well as work-life balance, and as we transition from say more traditional forms of learning where there was more face-to-face -face interaction to now there's more web-based interaction, web-based learning or virtual learning. Have you come across expectations where you expect the learner to be doing a lot of learning during weekends, during after hours, just to catch up with the amount of learning that they, they are expected to do at workplace and cannot do it during face-to-face -face sessions, but they have this just, just in time, anytime, anywhere learning opportunity available which they can utilize during the weekends or for example, after work hours. Just, just was curious from a learner's perspective what your experiences have been. So if I'm understanding your, correction, your, your question correctly, yes. it's how do we kind of help them navigate this incredible complexity and overload of information that they have that we're expecting of them at work and, and, but yet continues to bombard them when they go home. Correct, okay. you're right. So, so we're taking that on um, at AT&T with, with a, a massive reskilling effort of our workforce. And there are uh, many facets to this program. And a, a couple that I think are really important is that you have to be fully transparent with your workforce about what skill sets and what talent is going to be necessary inside the company for the future. And once you can show your workforce what skill sets are required in the future, then it's up to the corporation to create curriculums and content so that the learners then can, can opt in and decide to engage. So at AT&T, we've got about 3,000 different jobs across our entire enterprise, and our corporate university in partnership with business unit leaders have created curriculums for every single one of those jobs. We also have, have systems that employees can go into and see what, what are the hot jobs, how are jobs trending. This, is a legacy network job. So there used to be X number of uh, employees in this job two years ago. Now there's a lower number of employees in this job now because it's a legacy service that we're turning down. This job, on the other hand, is really hot. There used to be 15 two years ago. Now there's 200. So people can get the perspective on this is a job that will take me into my career and, and, and it will have lots of longevity for however long I want to be within my career. And at, at what we found is once you can be completely transparent with employees about the skill sets that are necessary and then create the curriculums and, and give them access to all of those curriculums, then employees will opt in. And it's not a required training, if you will. It's a culture of continuous learning that if you want to be relevant in, in AT&T, then you have to opt in and you know that because you see how jobs are declining and how jobs are growing across the entire enterprise. Yeah, so, so like it's certainty and comfort that there is a place for you, but let's point out that it's not the same as where you're at now, but let's be transparent about where that is and how we can help you get there. Absolutely, and then you have to marry that with making sure that you've got delivery modes that can meet people's needs at home or while they're traveling. It's got to be in a mobile environment. It's got to be a fair amount of virtual so that people can engage on their own time when it's convenient for them. 
Anybody want to add one thought to that? And then I want to get one to thought is I would say I do think we have a responsibility, which I think you're saying as well. We do have responsibility to the learner um, as well, because ultimately that's who, if, you know, back to the concept of who are we serving? We actually are serving the learner. We are developing and growing people. Right. So I do think we have a responsibility to check ourselves. Mm -hmm. So as we're propagating all of this new learning, to your point, we should actually be looking at, hmm, if I put that together, that would be them doing learning for approximately five weeks out of the year, whether it's digital, in person or not. Hmm, that's probably not realistic. So we should relook at the architecture, you know, that we're putting out there. So I do think we should be holding ourselves, uh, you know, accountable, even with the everyday learning, everyday kind of expectation. Um, and excitement that comes with that, because frankly, we're finding people want that, they want the access, but then ask yourself the question, are we being reasonable in any given time and what we're asking people you know, to do? So I think we should, have, we, we should hold that responsibility as well. Yeah, so thank you for the question and all the questions. I wanna just wrap, and I wanna get just really quick final thought from you, because we are, are out of time here. Um, uh, somebody submitted the question through the app, what's the new trend you are learning about? So something that you all individually are spending time, your own time, energy to learn about. What's the new trend you are learning about that you'd like to share with the audience? And we'll finish with that. Ashley, you want to start us? Um, I don't know if it's a new trend or not, but we're spending a lot of time right now, and I'm spending a lot of time thinking about it, which is, I know it's not a new trend, which is uh, the effect of um, kind of health and well-being and the implication of that on uh, not only productivity, uh, but you know, happiness, engagement, all those things. And what do we do um, if we want to change management program around that? What do we do? How do we think about that? Because many of the, if you will, offerings that are out there in that space uh, have been proven highly ineffective. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of looking into that particular topic, again, as something that will drive uh, overall impact for, the, the, for our company uh, and the individuals there. Right. Sharon. Uh, we're very focused right now on taking a data-driven approach to coaching. So really assessing people's performance across 100 metrics and providing them with real insight as to how they can improve their performance specifically based on what they've done and what their performance looks like. So really trying to hone in on insights with big data for individuals. Uh, two, um, Oculus Rift, so amazing virtual reality is going to take the world by storm. Go get one. Uh, and the second is thinking. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research into the elements of thinking, in particular creative, cri critical, and completion thinking. And I think CLOs are spending way too much time in the completion thinking mode and not enough in creative and critical. We're very focused on looking at the ability to deliver training in virtual reality, augmented reality. How does artificial intelligence play into the future of learning? So. Those are the three big areas right now that, that I'm really spending a lot of time and mind share on. Great. 